Welcome to a new episode of Shaping Sustainable Supply Chains. Today we want to focus on the new geopolitical rivalries and its consequences on supply chains. What are friends, what enemies, or isn't it that simple? I'm Nicholas Martin. Great that you're listening. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has shown us the world is in a period of upheaval. Long-standing international laws such as the integrity of borders are being broken. Millions of Ukrainians are fleeing. And as a consequence of Russia's aggression, traditional trade relations are being questioned. Countries are reconsidering with whom and how much trade and interdependence they still want to allow. And a new terms making the rounds, French shoring, trades only with friends. What the term means, how to interpret it, and where supply chains are heading in times of geopolitical rivalry, that's what we are talking about today. My guest is Holger Görg, Interims President of the Kiel Institute for the World Economy and also Director of the Kiel Center for Globalization. Great to have you on the show. Hello, I'm delighted to be here. You have been in the service of science for a long time and your focus has almost always been on trade especially world trade, globalization, if you will. What's happened in the last three years, first with a the pandemic, then with the Ukraine war, was that also an exceptional situation from a scientific perspective? I'd say it has been, yes. Uh, it's been exceptional in the sense that we had uh, multiple events occurring in rapid succession in the last few years. Um, you could look back and say, well, we have had certainly epidemics uh, think of the SARS epidemic in the south uh, southeast asia a few years ago we've had natural disasters uh, think of uh, the fukushima um, accident uh, triggering a tsunami um, and they have all affected the world economy in different uh, different shapes and forms but uh, what is exceptional here is as i said that it's uh, multiple events in rapid succession i think we haven't seen that before And in terms of value chains, what do, you, what do you think have been the most relevant upheavals that these new circumstances have caused? That's a very good point. Uh, value chains, um, of course, uh, in, in, in some sense, these events are also particular um, and perhaps different from what we've seen in the past because uh, the world is now organized in global value chains or production in the world is organized in global value chains. So, meaning uh, one piece really feeds into the next one and there's a lot of dependency going on. And if one piece of the puzzle or if one part of the chain stops, then uh, we have a problem uh, and we have a global problem. So, uh, I think that's what we've seen here, starting with the pandemic when China was affected first and China stopped producing or certainly stopped exporting uh, due to various lockdown restrictions. That was really felt across the globe uh, because uh, of the because of the reliance on, on Chinese imports. And now with the war in Ukraine, this puzzle is even more broken now and we can say that there is a, also as a result a new expression in fashion which is French shoring. I mentioned it at the beginning. Can you elaborate a little bit what is meant by that, French shoring? Indeed, yes. I, I think we started thinking about it uh, when the pandemic hit and people realized they're very reliant on China. And uh, because of the like, political developments we've seen in China in the, the last couple of years as well, people started having doubts about uh, trading with China or being too dependent on China. And the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine really brought home the problem, really showing that what the negative impacts of what, what, what could happen if you trade with partners that are um, not as reliable as you thought they might have been. So Germany, particularly Germany, uh, traded a lot with Russia, in particular in terms of, of energy supplies. And that really turned out badly for Germany. Uh, once Russia invaded Ukraine and once, san once sanctions uh, hit the Russian economy and we had countermeasures by the Russians uh, 
which really affected German production. So yeah, out of the perhaps realization that you trade with countries that you may not really be able to trust um, in all aspects, out of that came the expression of French sharing. That really means we try to trade more with countries that we are friendly with um, and that therefore we may be able to trust more and where we should be sure that um, trade relationships wouldn't be exploited for uh, any political motives. You mentioned China. The sensitivity has increased towards China and there is this emerging fear of becoming too dependent. But is this fear reasonable from your point of view? Well, I, I certainly think it's exaggerated um, in uh, certainly the media, but also the, the public discussions about so-called dependencies on China. Uh, it's also really a term that's been used in this context only in the last two or three years. Um, before that, we talked about trade relationships, strong trade relationships or less strong trade relationships. So there's uh, obviously a, a change in the mood uh, that he, you, you can derive from this uh, new term. Yeah, are we dependent, uh, too dependent on China? Uh, that's a question. Uh, well, it, it really is a question and we don't have an answer to it because what exactly is meant by a dependency is not really that clear. Of course, China is one of the largest trade partners for the European Union, for Germany in particular, but so is the U.S., They're also a very important trade partner. So you could say we're also very dependent on the US. We have trade relationships with a lot of other countries. So what exactly do you mean by a trade relationship? It can't just be that we export a lot or import a lot from a particular country. In in some discussions, it it's a bit more focused and there is talk about, uh, we, we were talking about strategic inputs, for example, that are being imported from particular countries. And yes, that's true. Uh, there are obviously strategically important inputs, even though, again, we don't really know. There's no clear definition what this means. Is it just an input that is uh, produced by very few suppliers? Is it inputs that are very crucial for the production of particular goods? Is it inputs that's very crucial for defense, security? Uh, so all these different aspects are in the discussion, but it's not really clearly defined. So let's just take an example or let's just take a, a broader view, uh, if you will. So my colleagues at the IFO Institute in Munich did a study or uh, wrote a paper recently where they also look at what they call strategic inputs, if you will. And they were defined in the way that these are inputs that Germany can't produce on its own very easily. And there are also inputs that come from relatively few suppliers and so on. The gist of it is, of this uh, work, is that if this is your measure of dependency, then we're highly dependent on the European Union. 73, so almost three quarters of, in, in that way, defined strategic imports come from the EU. Important is the chemical industry, pharmaceuticals industry is very important and so on. Mm -hmm. So the EU uh, is the biggest, then the US, China, only 3% of all strategically important inputs, the way they define it, come from China. In the pharmaceuticals industry, it's 0.15% of strategically important inputs are in the pharmaceuticals industry and are imported from China. So it's minuscule. It's really small. But having said that, of course, there are particular inputs where it is very crucial and where there there is potential dependency. Here we have this example when Russia invaded Ukraine first uh, at the beginning of the year, um, we were looking or the German automobile industry was looking for very particular types of uh, electric cables, uh, which were apparently only or to a large extent produced in Ukraine. And uh, that brought with it massive problems. So yes, there, there are dependencies, but uh, I think Looking at China and saying we're dependent on China really um, exaggerates and some, it is somewhat beside the point, really. We have to be very, very careful on what we mean with dependencies. You mentioned inputs, but what about the outputs, the exports? I mean, you also mentioned uh, car manufacturers. China is a very important for them. When you talk about this definition of dependence, Uh, shouldn't that also take into consideration uh, such interests? Or would you say, okay, um, that is not as important as inputs like critical 
materials, for instance. No, I also think that's important. Um, so uh, yes, you're right. The dependency or the or the trade relationship, of course, also uh, encompasses the export side, and to uh, um, especially important for Germany. And yes, here some firms do heavily concentrate on the Chinese market. Yeah, you mentioned the automobile companies. That's true. Others do the same. Others are very involved in other markets. And I think particularly here comes the question again, what do we mean by dependency? So if a car company has, I don't know, uh, a large share of its sales, of its revenues from the Chinese market, then yes, that's happening. And that's a, a decision the company takes uh, based on presumably a very good risk assessment of where, where the risks are and where the opportunities are. Um, and if... Uh, a firm decides this is where I want to sell my goods, then um, that's a private business decision a firm takes, um, which it should be allowed to take. I think it's more crucial on the import side, perhaps, where, uh, as I said before, where we, yeah, where we are involved in, in global value chains and where if we're losing out one particular input, this will have ramifications for the whole um, um, value chain. And do you think that Germany, I mean, you said at a national level, has a clear vision of, of what dependence means? Or do you think there are still a lot of uh, contradictions? I don't think there is a clear strategy. I think there's um, people and policy are now working on it. There is a discussion in policy along the lines of coming up with the China strategy. So, And that, of course, evolves at least partly around dependencies I think there's a larger debate among policy makers in Berlin about uh, a national security strategy. And at the heart of this again, or not at the heart, but part, an important part of this is also again uh, uh, thinking about dependencies of particular products or from particular um, suppliers, countries. Uh, as uh, scientists, as a research institute, we are involved in these discussions, uh, but As far as I can see, they are still at a fairly early stage. So, no, I, I think it's not clear in Germany what exactly we mean by uh, strategically important inputs. It's not exactly clear how we define dependencies. And, um, yeah, I think uh, there we need to come to some conclusions fairly soon. And do you think other countries are quicker than we are? For example, the US, uh, in terms of their perspective and definitions on what dependence means? Yes, I, I, I believe so. So partly perhaps also reflecting um, that in Germany, we probably for a long time were quite happy to, or didn't see the writing on the wall perhaps as, uh, as much as other countries did and uh, I'm, I'm no exception to that. I always thought trading with China and Russia is perhaps not such a big problem. It could even have positive effects. Um, now we certainly with Russia we know that uh, was not the case and with China there's also not still not a clear strategy how to deal with it. I, I think particularly the, the US has started much earlier to think about this much more seriously and Without saying whether I agree with the strategy or not, uh, I think one example is uh, the recent decision to ban Huawei from the American markets. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a very clear decision and it reflects that there obviously is a very clear strategy on what exactly the Americans see as the problem and what exactly they see as strategic inputs or strategic sectors in the economy and uh, sectors where they do not want the influence or a dependency on suppliers from particular countries or on companies from particular countries. But on the other hand, like in the US, there's also, for example, the Inflation Reduction Act that, I mean, is also a result, from my interpretation, uh, on their perspective and definition of what dependence means. So they want some supply chains back at home, let's put it that way. And they're putting uh, quite a big uh, stack of subsidies to attract battery producers, for instance. Is this also, like I said, a result of a definition of what dependence means? What do you think? Um, yeah, as a, a reflection on what dependence means and also a reflection on how to deal with China. Um, I think the, the 
uh, Inflation Reduction Act goes back to a much larger initiative that was planned, which which was uh, termed Build Back Better World. Uh, well, and that in itself was a reaction to the Belt and Road Initiative by the Chinese. Um, so it it even probably predates the Corona crisis to some extent, but this has probably sharpened um, their minds again. So there there was, I think, in the U.S. A perception even yeah, even before Corona that China is rising, um, that uh, it's a potential rival, uh, and that uh, they need to deal with it. And some way of dealing with that was to re- reduce dependencies on the economy. So you had also a trade war initiated by the Trump government, uh, and that's still ongoing to to a large extent. And here is another step where yes, especially high-tech production like battery production which has also got um, green aspects which are an important part of this IRA but essentially it's high-tech production where the Americans decided they do not want to be too dependent on China or other countries and try and get some of this production development design and production of this uh, of these products back into their own economy and as you say they're taking quite a bit of money into their hands to try and do that. And yeah, but whether that's useful, whether it's really going to work for them is certainly debatable. If I got you correctly, you're calling for a clearer definition of independence. And at the beginning, we, we talked about the term friendshoring. Do you think that there is a space for the term French shoring in the clearer definition of what dependence means? Well, as an academic, perhaps it's my role to ask a few more questions before we come up to uh, with answers. And the general concept of French shoring seems to make a lot of sense. If you, if you have trade partners that you can't trust, well, trade with the ones that you can't trust and that are your friends. That makes an awful lot of sense. If you have the choice, sorry, yes, of course, and a very important point. Um, and where the, the question comes in is, uh, well, who exactly is your friend? And uh, will they remain your friend? I think that's a big question. So uh, five, six, certainly 10 years ago, uh, a lot of Germans would have considered Russia as a friend and traded a lot with it. And uh, certainly now they are not considered a friend. Um, so in other words, friends can change. The second point is to consider uh, whether there is an option to trade with a friend, uh, whether it's a possibility at all. So, for example, there's a discussion in Europe and Germany uh, in particular going on about um, trade in energy inputs, gas in particular. Here we moved away from Russia for obvious reasons uh, and moved towards or trade now more with countries like, for example, Qatar, um, which even before the World Cup was uh, considered a country um, with which you could have issues, to put it uh, Yeah. Put it in that way. Yeah. One reason for this is, of course, because there aren't that many options of potential trading partners. So um, it's not so easy to implement the French shoring, uh, even if you're quite sure that you are trading with friends. Um, it's not always easy to find friends that also uh, trade the good or provide the good that you're looking for. And there are also parts of the government in Germany that say, okay, we should define friends according to our values. Do you think that makes any sense looking at, for instance, having trade with Qatar? Well, of course, um, from a moral perspective, it makes sense, of course. Uh, ideally, we would want to do that and uh, trade with, so define friends as countries that share our values. Um, but then... In the world, we would be left with uh, fairly few trading partners. We're now in an age uh, where we have more autocracies in the world than democracies, uh, and I think the number is increasing. So, yeah, if we really wanted to do that, uh, we'd be left with very few trading partners in the EU uh, or in Europe, um, in North America, South America. Yeah, you can find them on every continent, but... Uh, There are also a lot of countries that do not share uh, the values we have. Uh, and therefore, I think certainly as it is uh, currently, as our production structure is, as our trade structure is, uh, it's not really realistic to just trade with countries that share our values. 
Mm. Nevertheless, do you think that this whole discussion about French shoring and whom to have trade with could result in new opportunities for countries in the global south? I do believe that, yes. So uh, I think coming back to the energy imports um, or energy supplies, we have the example of Senegal, for example, where um, we now have uh, increased trade relationships in order to source gas from there. We have discussions going on, projects uh, being started uh, with countries, certainly in North America, uh, North Africa, like Morocco, about production and supply of green hydrogen. So I think these are very uh, important examples that show that for developing countries, this change in, say, the way we view the world or the, the way we organize production chains um, can be uh, an opportunity to get involved. I, I think it's also true for, say, more traditional production chains, that production is moving away from China and perhaps other countries in the uh, Southeast Asia, and hopefully towards towards Africa to involve these countries more in, in supply chains. You've mentioned the energy as an example for enhanced cooperation. Since Russia also fell away as a gas supplier, Germany is and was in something of an emergency situation. And you mentioned it, liquefied gas now comes from Qatar. And there are other countries like Congo, for instance, um, that play an important role uh, for future technologies. These are the countries where we cannot decide whether we want to trade or not to trade almost. Doesn't that totally contradict that concept of French shoring? So I think the problem really is that the principle of French shoring uh, is, uh, is very good, sounds very good, makes an awful lot of sense. I think we do have um, actually quite a few uh, products or sectors where this just uh, doesn't really work because we have dependencies on countries that um, we might not really want to consider as friends and certainly don't share our values. French shoring rather a myth than reality. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Holger Görg, Interim's President of the Kiel Institute for the World Economy. Thank you very much. And thank you all for listening to our podcast. We will be back with a brand new episode soon. I'm Nicholas Martin. Thanks for listening to Shaping Sustainable Supply Chains. <laughs>